In this video, I'll show you how to scan a traditional pen or pencil drawing so that you can color it digitally on your computer. That's coming up next. Thanks for joining me today. I'm digital artist Aaron Rutten, and it is my mission to help artists like you enjoy digital art and learn some new skills along the way. Today, I'm gonna to be showing you how to scan your traditional art so that you can color it digitally. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing that you're gonna need is a scanner. I'm using the Epson Perfection V600 Photo. Now this is not a sponsored video. I bought this scanner with my own money. I needed a scanner that could scan both art and photographs, and this was pretty reasonably priced with good reviews on Amazon. I'll put a link down in the description of this video. Regardless of which scanner you own, you're gonna to want to go ahead and locate the scanning settings or the scanning control panel for that particular scanner. Now in the Epson scan, I'm gonna switch the mode in the top right to home mode. And then for document type, I'm gonna go ahead and set this to the preset of illustration. If you have presets in your scanning application, go ahead and choose one of those that best fits what you wanna scan. Now, this is not a color image that I'm gonna be scanning, so I'm gonna go ahead and just set this to grayscale. Grayscale is preferable to black and white because black and white will be only black or white and no shades in between. For destination, I'm gonna choose other and that will let me choose a custom resolution. Now, 300 is probably the lowest you wanna go, but you do wanna be able to scan this with enough detail to where you're not gonna have any blurriness or pixelation, but you don't wanna go too high because you'll have a really big file size. So for example, I'll set it to 1600 for now. This is the image that I'm going to scan, so you can see it's not very complicated, not a lot of fine lines or anything like that. Now you do want to make sure that you've installed the drivers for your scanner. You want to make sure if it's been sitting out for a while that you might dust off a little bit of the dust that's on there. I'm just going to blow it off. Just be careful not to spit on it or anything like that. That'll make it worse. If you have some nice lens cleaning cloths, you could use those too. But the more dust you can get off now, the less dust is going to show up in your scan. So I'm going to go ahead and place this face down because the scanning comes from the bottom up. And then I'm gonna match it up with the top left corner because that's where the orientation point is for this particular scanner. And just make sure that your paper is flush with the top and the side, that way your page won't end up being rotated after it's scanned. Now I'll go ahead and just close the lid on the scanner. And now in my scanner control panel, I'll just click on preview and we can make sure that our scan is working correctly. This isn't gonna be a full scan, it's just gonna be a quick preview. And I think that looks good. If it doesn't look good to you, make whatever adjustment you need to make to your image inside the scanner. Now, if you know you wanna be printing this at a very specific size, you could set the target here and you could pick a specific output size. I'm gonna go ahead and just leave it at original so that it comes out at its original scan size. And then next, I'll click on the scan button. Now it gives me a few more options here. I can choose where I want the scan to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and just choose desktop. And then I can choose the format. Now I'm gonna go ahead and choose TIFF because that's gonna be the highest quality option here. You could also choose PDF. I recommend not choosing JPEG because while that will be a smaller file size, it's also gonna make the visual quality a lot lower in your image. Now, because we chose a high resolution to scan at, it's giving us a warning saying it's going to take a while to scan. And it's not kidding. It's giving me an estimate of six minutes here and it does end up taking quite a few minutes to scan. That's because it's scanning in very high detail. So it's taking a lot longer to scan than if you chose a lower resolution setting. So it's kind of a trade off here. If you scan in a higher resolution, you're gonna get a higher quality image, which is a good thing, especially if there's a lot of fine details in your work, but then the file size is going to be much larger and the scan is gonna take longer. However, if you were to use maybe like a mid setting or a lower setting, the scan won't take quite as long and you might get just enough detail that you need without getting too much detail. So you may wanna just try a couple of different scans and then look at them up close and determine which one is gonna be best for you. And I'll show you how we can do that here in just a minute. All right, so our scan has completed. Here's our TIFF file, and we can go ahead and just open that in Photos. And then I'll go ahead and just zoom into it. And you can see there's a lot of detail here. There's more detail than we actually need. You can see individual specks of dust, and you can see all the little pieces of pulp in the paper and little spaces here in between the ink. This is way too much detail for this particular image. It's completely unnecessary. However, there are a few little fine details which a high resolution scan like this would preserve, such as some of the intentional dots on the image and some of the hatching. Let's go ahead and create another scan so that we can make a comparison. I wanna go ahead and just set the resolution lower now to a mid setting like 600. And I'll go ahead and just click the scan button to scan it again. I'll choose these same settings. And now you can see there's a huge difference in how long it's taking to scan. This is actually real time. I'm not speeding up the footage at all and it's taking under a minute to scan. 
So that's much more reasonable than several minutes like it did on the more high resolution scan. So now if we open this file and we zoom into it, you can see you don't quite see as much of that dust. You can still make out a few of the bigger pieces of dust, but the smaller ones aren't there. But there's still probably enough detail for all of the details in this image to be captured. If we do a side-by-side -side comparison here, you can see that all we're really gaining by adding that resolution is just dust. Now if we compare the file size, the high resolution version is 242 megabytes. If we look at the properties here under details, we can see that it is tens of thousands of pixels. That's a lot of pixels for something that you would print relatively small. Now if we look at the other example, that's only 34 megabytes. And if we look at the details, then it's not quite that many pixels. So that's probably a little bit more reasonable for what I would ever use this image for. So once you've selected a scan, you can go ahead and bring it into Photoshop. I'm gonna go ahead and use the 600 DPI version here. Then I'm going to select the crop tool and I'm going to crop off the outer edges there so that we don't see the scanner bed and also it removes some vignetting or some shadowing along the edge. Now, unless you wanna permanently delete those pixels, make sure delete cropped pixels is unchecked and then click on the check to commit. And now we have a nice clean crop. Let's go to image, image rotation, 90 degrees clockwise. And we'll do that one more time to put the image upright. I could have made sure it was upright in the scanner as well. And I'll go ahead and zoom in and we can look at this very closely and we can try to get rid of some of this dust and some of the stuff that we don't want. I'm gonna to go to the filter menu. I'm gonna look under noise and dust and scratches. And then I wanna set this to a pretty low radius and threshold setting. You wanna set the radius till you see an effect and then if you need to set the threshold, you can set that. But two and one is a pretty good setting there. And then if we use Control Z to undo and redo, you can see the effect that that's having. It's getting rid of the dust and it's getting rid of the white speckles in our ink area. Now that worked really well for this particular image because it's just basic black on white. But if you had a lot more detail in your image and a lot more colors, you may find that this particular dust removal effect can do more harm than good. So just be careful with it and don't overdo it to the point to where it ruins the detail in your artwork. Now another issue you might be having if you're doing a black and white image like this is there might be some shadow on the edges of the paper. So to get rid of that, you can add a levels adjustment down in the layers palette. And then starting out, you can try the auto button, see if that helps. If it doesn't, then you can move these sliders. The left one controls the black and the right one controls the white and the gray one in the middle controls the midtones. Now we really only want black and white here so we can bring the black in and the white in toward the middle. And that's gonna turn anything that was close to black, solid black, and anything that was close to white, solid white. So that shadowy area on the paper will turn from kind of a light gray into a white. But again, be careful not to overdo it because you can ruin some of the detail in your piece, especially if your image has a lot more colors than mine does. I'm gonna go ahead and hide that levels effect for a minute because I wanna show you another way that you can get a similar effect. I'm gonna to go to that layer there with the artwork on it, and I'm gonna to go to image adjustments, and then threshold. Threshold is gonna turn anything that's close to white into white and anything that's close to black into black. And you can kind of control that distribution with the slider here. So you can see I can have more black or more white in the image. The only disadvantage to doing it this way is you might lose a little bit of the detail and the lines might be a little bit more jagged or kind of photocopied looking compared to if you use levels. Next, we can move on to cleaning up anything that's remaining that these filters didn't get. So there's a little smudge here that I know is not a mark from my pen. So I can select the brush tool with a hard edge, fully opaque. Then I can sample white or whatever color that's in the background there and just paint over that mistake. Or if my artwork's not this simple and it has a lot more colors going on, I could try the healing brush and I could paint over that area to go ahead and just replace that with something in the background. But overall, this image looks pretty clean. There is kind of a mark down here at the bottom, which I'll have to figure out what to do with later. I could clean it up or I could leave it. We'll just have to see what I do. So now that we've made some changes, we don't wanna save over our original scan. We wanna go ahead and go to File, Save As, and we wanna save a copy. I'm gonna name this Scanned Corrected, and I'm gonna change the file format from TIFF to Photoshop PSD. Now it's important that if you chose to scan your image in grayscale, you'll need to go to Image Mode and change it from grayscale to RGB color, otherwise you won't be able to add any color to this piece. If you don't want your layers to be merged, choose Don't Merge doesn't really matter because I'm gonna go ahead and just merge that levels effect down so that it's permanently applied. Then I'll go ahead and just name this layer art. Next I'll create a new layer. I want that to be above my art and I want the blend mode to be multiply. I'm gonna go ahead and name this yellow. 
because the color that I'm going to put down here is yellow, and I'm going to keep my colors on separate layers. I'll show you why later. I'm going to select a hard edge, fully opaque brush, and I'm just going to go ahead and just fill this in, just like you would a coloring book. Now, this is not the most efficient way to color an image. There are lots of tools you can use and lots of different techniques. I'm going to show you just a couple of them, but depending on which application you're using, you may even be able to automatically fill in shapes like this without having to color them in. So I'll go ahead and just show you the coloring method. I paint along the edges first because those are the most important, and then I use a bigger brush to fill in the center. If I overpaint, it's okay because that color is on a layer, so I can switch to my eraser, and then I can just go in and I can clean up anywhere where I overpainted. Now, because I want to keep my layers separate, I want to also go ahead and just erase that yellow from the lip area because I know I'm going to want to put pink in there later. Now, the way that I'm doing this is not the most efficient way to do it, and I'll go ahead and show you a better way to do it, but right now we're going to look at the inefficient way. So I'm just basically putting the yellow only where I want yellow. I'll create a new layer, and I'll name it pink, and this is where I will put my pink, and I'm only going to paint pink in that area. So I'll go ahead and select my pinkish color, I'll use that same brush, and I'll go ahead and paint here on the lips. Now you'll notice that the paint is covering the ink. That's because I need to set the blend mode to multiply. Now multiply can give you some issues because colors that overlap each other will start to look darker. If I were to overlap the pink on top of the yellow, then it would create something that's almost black. So it's not the best way to color, but it's a good way to do it if you just want to be able to color something quickly without doing a lot of steps. I'm going to hide those layers so we can look at another way to do this. Ideally, what we want to do is we want to separate the white background from the black lines. So I'll go ahead and create a new layer and move it underneath my ink. I'll call it background, and we'll just fill that background with a color other than white. I'll go to edit fill to do that, and we'll fill with foreground color. Now you're not going to see anything happen because the white background is covering up that color. So I'm going to double click to the right of that layer. And then down here at the bottom where it says this layer, I'll just reduce that white slider to the left until the white disappears. Make sure you do just enough to where you don't start to eat away at your black edges, but you don't leave a little bit of white edge along the edge of the black. Zoom in just to make sure that you don't have anything going on like that. I think that looks pretty good. And then now we want to take our ink or our lines and move them up so that they're the topmost layer and that our color is underneath that. We can change the composite method back to normal for our color layers. And now we have something that's going to be a lot more useful. I'm going to create a new layer. I'm going to make sure that that's underneath the yellow, and I'm going to call it blue. I'm going to select a nice blue color, select my brush, and go ahead and just fill in the blue area. Now, what's cool about working with this technique is that even if you're not happy with the color after you put it down, you can always change that color later because it's separate from all the other colors and it's separate from the line work. So if you're not happy with this blue, you can always change it to something later. I'll show you how to do that in just a little bit. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's lots of different ways to color in stuff. For example, we could select the polygonal lasso tool up here in the toolbar, and then just tap to create points staying within your black line and not going outside of it, and then just go all the way along the edge. When your selection's complete, go to Edit Fill, and then just fill it with that color. Now if I want to go back to using that yellow color, I can sample it, and I can make sure that I'm painting on that yellow layer, and I can add in some more paint. The yellow is on top of the blue, so I'm able to paint on top of the blue. I'm going to go ahead and add another new layer. I'm going to call this white. I want to make sure white's on top of yellow. I'll select white, and I'll put in some white here on the eyes. And then I can sample that pink, make sure I'm painting on the pink layer, and I can add in some more pink. Again, I'm just keeping all of my colors separate. Now let's take a look at another method of filling in the lines. This time I'm going to go to the magic wand tool. I'm going to make sure that I click on the layer that has my ink lines. And then I'm going to click with the magic wand in this eyeball area here. As long as I'm clicking within a closed shape, it's just going to select that area. I'll go to the white layer now, and I'll go ahead and just go to Edit Fill, and I'll fill it with that white color. Now you could also use the paint bucket, but you might find that depending on what the paint bucket is set to or which application you're using, that it might not fill all the way to the edge, and it might leave a little bit of a gap like you can see here. There's still blue pixels from the previous color. If you keep filling it again and again, it'll keep eating away at your black edge, and it'll make your edges look very jagged and unnatural. You notice on the other side, the blue goes all the way to the black. Now, there is a bit of a gray margin between the black and the color, but that's because the ink layer is not completely black. So to fix that, we'll go ahead and group the ink layer with Control G, and then we'll merge it with Control E. That'll go ahead and apply that removal of the white background that we put in earlier. And now let's add a layer effect for color overlay, and we'll select black as our color, and that'll turn all of the pixels on that layer to black. 
And if we wanted to later, we could change the color of the lines to a different color by going back and editing this color. And then just scan around your artwork and make sure that there aren't any mistakes that are caused by doing this. I noticed that, I don't know if it really helps that little flaw down in the bottom there. I think it kind of does, so I'll just leave it be for now. If you wanted to fix something like that, you could always erase that part of the ink layer and then just draw it in with a brush. Now let's take a look at how easy it is to edit the colors. On that pink layer, I'm gonna add a color overlay, and then I'm just gonna select a different color, and we can actually just toggle through a bunch of different colors to see on the fly how that's going to affect that layer. We can easily pick the best color or color that we like. I'm gonna go ahead and just pick something that's drastically different here, like this orange. And at any time, we can go back and we can edit this effect now to get a different color. I'm gonna add a color overlay to the yellow, and we can pick a different color for that. We will make kind of a pink color like this. And we can turn that effect on and off at any time if we like. If we want to be able to see our original color, I'll go ahead and just turn those off because I like the original colors that I chose. So once you're pretty happy with your color, go ahead and go to File, Save As, and we can go ahead and save a copy here. I'm going to call this Scanned Corrected Colored, that way I know what it is, and I have older versions if I ever want to go back to them. I'm going to go to the background layer now, and let's change it from this gray to something else. I'll add a color overlay effect, and we can choose a color. Maybe kind of a light pink color will look all right. And then next, I want to go ahead and group the ink and the color layers together by holding Shift, selecting them all, and then hitting Control G. I'll go ahead and just name that group Art. And now if we wanted to, we could move this around. We could transform it by going to Edit Free Transform. And then if we wanted to squash it, we could do that. Or we could rotate it on the corner here. But even though we're moving it around and changing it, all of our ink lines and our color layers are still all separate from each other. They're just grouped together. We can also select the arrow tool, hold Alt, and drag over a clone, and then we could scale that down and we could have a little smaller clone. You'll notice that it made a duplicate of our group there. Now that your drawing is digital, another thing you could do with it now is animate it if you wanted to. I'm going to right click on that group and I'm going to go ahead and duplicate it, and I'll just call this a warp. I'll go ahead and hide my original, and then I'll hit Ctrl E to merge that warp group into a single layer. Now I can go to Edit Puppet Warp. And basically what I do is I put pins where I don't want the object to move. Those are the areas that I want to stay still. So I'm just gonna put some pins in all of the major areas. What I wanna move here are maybe like the little tentacles and things like that. So then I'll start putting some pins in those and think about the different joints as if this were an arm bone or a leg bone. There'd be like a knee and a toe and a shoulder and things like that. And then I can drag those pins and I can completely reshape this image. I'll go ahead and click on that check to commit that transformation. Now if I hit undo and redo, I have my animation here. So I'm gonna go ahead and just delete that extra layer, and let's just go ahead and save a final copy of our artwork. I'm gonna to go to File, Save As. I wanna save my master copy as a PSD, and then I wanna save a copy if I wanna print it or put it on the web. I'll go to Save As again, and I could choose something like a PNG if I wanna post it on the web. If I don't want my artwork to have a background, I can hide the background layer. And then I can go ahead and save a copy again by going to Save As. And again, I'll save as a PNG or a format that supports background transparency. I'll just call this dash no BG and save it. Now I'll have a copy with and without a background. Now because I was doing this for demonstration's sake, I was a little bit quick and sloppy when I colored this in and I didn't get every single area filled in here. So I'm just gonna go back to that blue layer and just make sure that I clean up all those edges and just do a better job than I did here in this demonstration when you fill in your line art, because one of the worst things you can do is just have sloppy color jobs like this where there's gaps in between your lines and your color. This is also a good reason to use something like the selection tools or the magic wand tool to fill in your lines rather than doing it manually. So that's the basics of scanning and coloring your artwork, but before we go, I want to talk a little bit about what to do if you want to scan something that's larger than your scanner. In this case, I have this giant painting. What if I want to scan this? Well, it doesn't fit, and I can't even close the lid, so unfortunately I can't scan it this way, and I would have to photograph this piece. But once it's photographed, you could still go through the same process that you followed here to clean up your image. If you found this tutorial helpful, take a quick second to click the like button, and go on over to patreon.com slash Aaron Rutten to join me on my mission to create more free resources for digital artists. And if you're new to my channel, I'd love to have you subscribe. I have a lot more videos like this that can teach you things you didn't know about digital art. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.